Good morning, fellow Academy members. My name is Joan Vitello, and I am honored to be one of the co-chairs of the expert panel on acute and critical care. Today we are co-sponsoring this exciting webinar with the expert panel on aging. In fact, Tara Cortez, the chairperson of that panel, will be collating your questions for our speaker at the end of her presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Toby Edelman, who has graciously agreed to share her knowledge and expertise regarding admit to observation patients. Ms. Edelman is the Senior Policy Attorney at the Center for Medicare Advocacy in Washington, D.C. She has been representing Medicare recipients in their interests at the national level since 1977. She is very well versed on this topic and we are truly honored to have her with us this morning. Please join me in welcoming Toby Edelman. Toby, it is all yours. Thank you. Very delighted to be here to talk to you about observation status, uh, an issue that we're very concerned about that has really been harming a lot of people. So what we want to talk about this morning is uh, what the issue is. What does observation status mean? How does it affect access, cost, and quality? Some of the studies and articles that have looked at observation status in the last couple of years in particular, and I want to tell you what we tell clients when they call us about how to appeal, when to appeal, what to do, whether it's worth appealing, and the efforts that we are making to get some strategic, uh, strategic change in this system so that we don't have individuals facing this problem all the time. Uh, the strategies for systemic change include litigation, which has not been successful so far, and federal legislation that's pending in Congress. The issue of observation status comes up because the Medicare statute, since the beginning of the Medicare program, has limited nursing home coverage in skilled nursing facilities to Medicare beneficiaries who have been hospitalized for medically necessary hospital care for at least three consecutive days, not counting the day of discharge. Medicare does not count days in 24-hour periods. It counts by midnights. Uh, and so what, what the shorthand really is that people need to be in the hospital as inpatients for at least three midnights. The Medicare statute also does not define inpatient care at all. But the guidance has said from the very beginning that this is a medical decision made by the physician. The physician is supposed to consider whether the patient is likely to be in the hospital overnight and look at a number of factors. What is the medical history of this patient? What are the patient's current medical needs? Is there a possibility of something adverse happening to the patient if the patient is not in the hospital? Does the patient need the treatment, the care, the services, the professional care that only a hospital can provide? That has been the standard from the beginning of Medicare to decide whether people need to be in patients. The three midnight rule in the Medicare program uh, may or may not apply to managed care organizations. They may require a three-day hospital stay. Some do not. As I said, the Medicare statute and regulations do not define observation status, and the term is, is discussed only in the Medicare manuals. The manuals say that observation is appropriate while the hospital, while the physicians, the nurses make a decision about whether to admit the patient as an inpatient or whether the patient can be safely discharged from the hospital. The manual will say that generally observation should not exceed 24 to 48 hours. The reason this is an important issue for observation is that time spent in observation status or in the emergency room before an inpatient admission or instead of an inpatient admission does not count towards meeting the three-day qualifying inpatient stay. We've had that decision from the court in these two cases that, that our program has bought, uh, brought, Landers versus Levitt, where that court de decided that uh, inpatient time is defined as defined by the secretary, and so the observation time did not count. We have later litigation back now, which is now on appeal. I'll talk about those in a little bit later. One of the things that CMS allows uh, 
hospitals to do is reverse the decision of the attending physician. And so we hear about this frequently. The attending physician says, I'm admitting my patient to inpatient status. My patient is an inpatient, needs inpatient care in the hospital. But the hospital, hospital's utilization review committee has the authority to persuade or basically coerce physicians to retroactively reverse that admission decision and change the status to outpatient observation. It doesn't go in the other way. There is no retro retroactive inpatient status. Inpatient status begins when there's a physician order for inpatient care and that status goes forward only. But, but the CMS uh, condition code 44, part of the Medicare manual, allows hospitals to reverse the attending physician's decision. This obviously created a lot of concern in the medical community um, and in hospitals. People who are in observation are in a hospital bed and they receive medical care, nursing care, tests, treatment, medications, food, the wristband, everything, but they are called outpatients. They're covered by Part B, not inpatients covered by Part A. And we think in many situations the physicians and nurses and therapists in the hospital have no idea of patients, if patients are inpatients or outpatients because they are generally uh, intermingled with inpatients. Mm -hmm. So people in one bed can be an inpatient, and in the next bed they can be an outpatient. Except for the hospitals that have observation units, most hospitals still uh, intermingle people. And so you have no idea if the person's an inpatient or an outpatient. And we've had clients uh, under the rules who've, who've been outpatients, and then their status has changed to inpatient, and nothing changed. They didn't change beds, they didn't even change wristband, nothing changed. They had no way of knowing that their status was changed. So to us, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to call somebody an outpatient when they're getting the same care that an inpatient gets. They get what's medically necessary for them, but their status makes a big, a big difference in what happens. So care is generally the same, they're intermingled, and Importantly, patients are often not told about their status until the time of discharge. Uh, the Medicare program does not require that hospitals tell patients that they are outpatients if the, physician, if the physician's initial decision is this patient should be an outpatient. Then there's no requirement that hospitals tell the patients that they are outpatients. The only time the Medicare program requires hospitals to tell patients that they are outpatients is under condition code 44 if their status is retroactively changed from inpatient to outpatient. So even though the care is identical to what they would get as an inpatient, there are serious consequences for patients about being called outpatients. And the consequences are primarily financial. First, they're denied Part A coverage for their hospital stay. Uh, now, this is a, an issue for patients who don't have Part B. And we have heard from a handful of people over the last six or so years who did not have Part B, and then they were charged the hospital sticker price. So people were in the hospital overnight, got a bill for $17,000. Most people have Part B, so that's not the question for them, but they are being denied coverage for Part A. They're also denied Part A coverage for their prescription drugs while they're in the hospital. They're, if people are in a Part A stay, that's all inclusive. It includes everything that's being done, including the drugs. Uh, but if they're in outpatient status, if they're in observation, the prescription drugs are, are not covered, and they have to seek out-of-network coverage from a Part D plan. The most important financial consequence, of course, is the denial of coverage uh, for the skilled nursing facility stay. And that can be very, very expensive. I was in a skilled nursing facility this past Sunday in Massachusetts, and the private rates range between $450 and $480 a day, about $13,000 a month. That's beyond uh, the means of many, many people. And especially when the nursing home knows that the person was in observation and that Medicare will not be paying for the skilled nursing facility, they demand payment up front. They're entitled to have payment, of course. And we've heard of situations where 
the nursing home will say to the nephew of a resident, bring a check for $7,000 today so that your aunt can be admitted to the skilled nursing facility. It's a problem for a lot of people. As I said, uh, the hospital is not required to notify the patient unless the status has been changed from inpatient to outpatient, but there is a brochure that CMS wrote called Are You a Hospital Inpatient or Outpatient? And it says that people should ask their physician, ask the nurse, ask somebody if they're an inpatient or an outpatient. Well, that's okay to ask, but if they ask and find out they're outpatients, there's really not anything they can do about it. And I was talking to a woman yesterday whose father had been in the hospital from sun since Sunday, so it's already four midnights, and they're telling her he's an he is an outpatient, and she's trying to get that fixed while she's there, but there really isn't any specific procedure or method to do that. Some new state laws, New York and Maryland, for example, are requiring hospitals to give notice to patients of their outpatient status, but that still does not give them a right to an immediate appeal of, of the Medicare. Once facilities get to a skilled nursing facility, they could potentially get a notice called a Notice of Exclusion from Medicare Benefits. This is a notice that nursing homes use for so-called technical denials of Medicare coverage. It's not level of care. They're not saying the person doesn't need skilled nursing facility care. This notice is for people who don't meet one of the technical requirements. So the first box on the form is no qualifying inpatient stay. Another box is the person has exceeded the 100 days in the benefit period, has already used the days in the benefit period. So the nursing homes could give that form, but they're not necessarily required to. Now, CMS has been very concerned about long outpatient stays. In 2005, when we were litigating the Landers case, in the annual update to Medicare skilled nursing facility benefits, CMS wrote in the Federal Register, uh, that it was looking at observation time and it asked if the time should be counted towards meeting the qualifying inpatient stay. That was in May 2005 in the proposed reimbursement red. When the final regulation was published in August of that year, CMS said, got a lot of comments, basically everybody said count the time in observation towards meeting the three-day stay, but CMS said it wanted to continue reviewing the policy. So it did not make a change at that point. Then in August 2010, CMS held a listening session. And at the time, uh, one of the CMS people told me they had more people call in on that issue than on any other issue they had ever had uh, a listening session about. And people called in all, almost all, critical of the use of observation status. And I remember one physician in particular said the difference between inpatient and outpatient can be five points on the sodium scale, which was very troubling to me because Medicare does not talk about five points on a sodium scale. That is uh, one of the proprietary systems that we'll talk about um, that makes the difference. And But that's what people think they have to do. So there's been a lot of concern. CMS was concerned about this. And the concern continued. In 2012, because there's been more and more discussion about observation status, CMS again asked in proposed rules whether, in two sets of proposed rules, whether it should change the rules for observation status. And they had a couple of ideas at that point uh, in the proposed rules. They asked if there should be automatic inpatient status after a certain amount of time if there should be prior authorization for inpatient status, if there should be time-based decisions on inpatient status, what did people think? When they wrote final regulations in 2012, they said, we're not changing the rules. We, we got comments. If we change the rules, we'll take these into consideration. So then we finally did get a change. And in 2013, uh, CMS proposed two sets of rules which it made final in August 2013 and they became effective October 1st. And the first and most relevant one for our discussion today is that CMS established for the first time time-based definitions of inpatient care. It's a two midnight rule. There are two midnight issues. One is a presumption and that says if the physician 
believes when the patient comes to the hospital that the patient will be in the hospital for two midnights or more, then the physician is supposed to make the patient uh, do an inpatient admission order and the patient will be an inpatient. If the physician is not clear that the patient will be in the hospital for at least two midnights, or if the physician thinks the patient will not be in the hospital for at least two midnights, then the physician is told to call the person an outpatient. But if the person's an outpatient for one night and then the next day the physician sees, ah, still here, still needs to be here, then the physician could issue, a, could have an inpatient admission order but the inpatient status, as I said, is only from the time the order is written going forward prospectively. There's another two midnight rule in these final regulations, and that's the two midnight benchmark. That says that if the reviewers uh, see that the person was in the hospital for observation for one night and an inpatient for one night, even though it's one was outpatient, one was inpatient, they should not look at that case and second guess what the hospital has done. But the basic presumption that we're concerned about is the two midnight presumption for the physician to give an admission order. Um, and, it, and from our perspective, we since these regulations went into effect October 1st, nothing has really changed. People are still in observation. As I said yesterday, the person whose daughter I talked to, four nights and counting. So it hasn't really changed practice. Now, there was a tr tremendous outcry about these regulations. Um, the American Hospital Association, the day they came out, within an hour, had a press release saying these are not good regulations. Um, and so CMS issued a temporary moratorium on enforcement of these regulations. And now, by law, the physician, the SGR law, the physician payment law, extended that moratorium through March 31st, 2015. Uh, but the rules, no matter what, uh, do not change the, the statutory uh, three midnight rule for inpatient hospital care as a prerequisite for Medicare coverage of a skilled nursing facility. So even some people thought, oh, two midnights, if you have two midnights, then Medicare pays for the nursing home. No, that is not correct. The Medicare statute still says three midnights, or says three days, but three midnights to get Medicare to pay for the nursing home care and inpatient care does not begin until there's a physician order for inpatient status. The American Hospital Association um, dislikes the rules and has filed two lawsuits challenging them. So those are at the very beginning and we don't know, of course, what will happen with that litigation. They were just filed recently. Two cases were filed recently. The second thing that these August rules did, uh, effective October 1st, is authorize hospitals to rebuild Part B if the Part A claim was denied or if the hospital decides on its own initiative within a year of providing care to the beneficiary that it wants to build Part B instead of Part A. This is responsive to what the hospitals were doing in observation status. A lot of hospitals were appealing the fact that the recovery audit contractors had come in and said patient should have been an inpatient, an outpatient instead of an inpatient, and therefore the hospital had to give back all of the reimbursement it got and had no payment for medically necessary care. The hospitals were appealing, and when they got to the administrative law judges, a number of the administrative law judges were saying, okay, this patient shouldn't have been an inpatient, but the hospital provided medically necessary services, so we will allow those services to be covered um, under Part B. Well, CMS did not like what the ALJs were doing because that could be years after the care was provided. And so what they did in the regulation is say hospitals can rebuild, but they have to do it within a year of providing the care. The hospitals don't like that because the recovery auditors can, auditors can come back up to three years and look at records. So this doesn't really do them any good. Um, but what I'm quite concerned about is that what's going to happen when hospitals start doing this? Uh, we haven't heard about this yet, but what the hospital is supposed to do is write to the patient and say, here is your Part A inpatient deductible back. We are going to bill you now instead 
for your Part B copayments, and we want you to pay for medications. Now, the rule does say that the Medicare coverage for the skilled nursing facility will still say, stay valid and in effect. So the re residents of nursing homes who probably have, would have gone to the hospital, then gone to the nursing home for however long, certainly not more than 100 days under Medicare, uh, and they might be home at that point, but, uh, and would be worried, I think people worried in the proposed regulations, will they have to give back the Medicare payment for the nursing home bill? So Medicare says no, that nursing home bill will be paid. But I think that we're going to have tremendous confusion from people getting letters from the hospital saying, here's your Part A deductible back, now give us these other payments. And I had an example several years ago of somebody who called who said uh, he had inpatient surgery in the hospital for, for prostate cancer. He was in the hospital overnight. He got a Medicare summary notice which said, you were an inpatient for your surgery. Here's what, Medi here's what the hospital wanted. Here is what we paid Medicare. And here is your inpatient deductible. Two or three years later, he got a new Medicare summary notice saying, we're not paying the hospital anything for your prostate surgery and you owe zero. But at the same time, he got a letter from the hospital saying, Medicare isn't paying for your surgery, so we would like $8,000. And I said to him, no, no, you don't pay $8,000. Medicare is saying the hospital gets nothing and you get nothing. So he went to the hospital, uh, brought the Medicare summary notice, and the hospital said, oh yes, that's correct. You owe nothing. In fact, we owe you money back because we have to give you back your inpatient deductible. So I, I anticipate come September, just before the one-year deadline comes for hospitals to decide to change their billing from A to B, that people might start getting letters like this. So we haven't had anything like it yet, but I am definitely worried about it. So now I want to talk just a little bit about uh, some of the studies and articles and research on observation uh, that have come out in the last couple of years. Our program has been writing about this since December 2008. The first time I got a call uh, from a woman in Wisconsin who had been in the hospital and then she went to the nursing home and the nursing home said, Medicare is not going to pay. You were not an inpatient in the hospital for three days. And she said, I was in the hospital for 13 days. And they said, well, you were an outpatient for 13 days. So we started wondering, what is going on? Why are people in observation for 13 days? And that's when we first started uh, looking into these extended observation stays um, and uh, writing about that problem. So Brown University did a study in 2012. They looked at 100% of the claims data between the years of 2007 and 2009, and they found that observation had increased by 34%, and inpatient admissions had decreased. Um, their conclusion was that observation was a substitution for inpatient admissions. That's what was happening uh, in the hospitals between 2007 and 2009. They found the average length of stay increased uh, in observation and that 10% of people were on observation for more than 48 hours, more than what the Me Medicare manual said should be the outer limit of outpatient status for somebody in a hospital bed. What the Brown study identified as the primary cause of these extended observation stays was the Recovery Audit Contractor Program and Condition Code 44. Now, as I said, the reason the Recovery Audit Contractor Program is the cause is that if the contractor comes in and says this person should have been an outpatient instead of an inpatient, the hospital has to give back all of the money um, and gets zero money. So hospitals are telling their doctors that it's better to call somebody an outpatient, at least we get the Part B payment from Medicare and the Part B co-payments from the patients and the drug charges. It's less, hospitals lose money when people are outpatients, but it's better than going through this whole process with the recovery audit contractor. 
So that, those two causes were identified by Brown University. The Inspector General of HHS did a report in 2013, and it described 1.5 million hospital stays in 2012, which were classified by the hospital as observation. And then they identified another 1.4 million stays, which were long outpatient stays. And what that means is that the, the person was in the bed, but was called an outpatient but the hospital did not bill for observation hours. When we look at the Medicare summary notice uh, for people in observation, each item under Medicare Part B for the hospital stay is listed separately, and then the very last item is usually observation hours. But there were an additional 1.4 million where the hospital listed every outpatient service separately, but did not bill for observation hours. And sometimes we know hospitals don't bill for observation hours, because the patient might be in the hospital for five and six days, and they know they're only supposed to bill for no more than 48 hours, so they just don't bill at all. This means nearly three million people were in the hospital and called outpatients in 2012. And the Inspector General found that more than 600,000 of them were in the hospital for three or more midnights, but not all of those midnights were called inpatient one or more of those midnights was called outpatient. Now, not all of those people went to nursing homes, obviously, but nursing homes are the biggest post-acute provider uh, after a hospital stay. So there are, obviously, the Inspector General found a lot of people being affected by observation status. The Inspector General recommended that CMS figure out how to make sure that people who had the same needs had the same access to uh, Cost, uh, to skilled nursing facility and the same cost sharing obligations. Of course, if people were only in the hospital as outpatients, they have to pay the entire amount of the nursing home as a private pay resident, unless they have Medicaid or VA but, or insurance. But basically, people are paying out of pocket. Whereas if they had a three day inpatient stay, Medicare, and then went to the nursing home, the skilled nursing facility for medically necessary services for the same or related condition. Medicare pays 100% for the first 20 days and then pays uh, with a large co-payment uh, co up to 100 days in the benefit period. So there are tremendous differences for the people uh, who are going to the skilled nursing facility and the Inspector General said they've got to be treated in the same way. Maybe we need legislation. Uh, at the University of Wisconsin, Ann Sheehy uh, is uh, the head of the Division of Hospital Medicine at the University of Wisconsin Hospital, and she's very active in dealing with observation status. She's very concerned about it. She's the hospitalist. She looked at all of the observation status and inpatient stays at their hospital between July 1, 2010 and the end of 2011 and they found that 10, over 10% 10 of these stays were observation, uh, and 16.5% were more than 48 hours. So there was a lot of observation status in her hospital. And some of these people, um, I've talked to her about this, she said some of the people are in the hospital, have come from like the community hospital, which believes that it needs, you know, the patient needs more care and is sending them to the university hospital so they know that people have to be in the hospital and they're still put in observation. It really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Even people coming from community hospitals are put in observation. Uh, so she found that more than a quarter of these people in observation had long lengths of stay. They were discharged to a skilled nursing facility. They had more unscheduled admissions, avoidable days, more repeat encounters. It was a real, ser really serious problem for their hospital, and she concluded that what's going on in observation in practice in the real world is very different from what CMS thought. Uh, and it's really, it's affecting the patients, obviously, it's affecting the healthcare providers, skilled nursing facilities for sure, who are losing money, and the hospitals. Uh, it's really not, not, working, not working the way they thought. Uh, in fact, one of the 
people, Dr. Wachter from University of California, San Francisco, was invited to respond to uh, Dr. Sheehy's article, and he wrote that observation status has morphed into madness. I love that. I was an English major, so I love that language. Morphed into madness. And he said, if one was charged with coming up with a policy whose purpose was to confuse and enrage physicians and nearly everyone else, one could hardly have done better than observation status. I thought that was quite fabulous. Um, it, it certainly is our experience that how can this make any sense. In fact, one of our clients in Connecticut uh, when the hospital told her that her husband was not a patient in their hospital, she said to them, well then, who the hell have I been visiting every day for the last week? I mean, it was completely ridiculous. So, of course, it has morphed into madness and is getting worse. Uh, uh, Dr. Sheehy did a second study applying the new rule, the two midnight rule, and she applied it retroactively to the stays in their hospital. University of Wisconsin Hospital between January 1st, 2012 and February 2013. And what she found is that um, if people are admitted after 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they're more likely to be called inpatients. So time of day that the person shows up in the hospital is really important for determining if they're inpatients or outpatients. This is crazy. I mean, this really makes no sense. So uh, she thought that she found that there was not much overlap in the diagnosis codes for their short in-state inpatients and their observation patients. And the codes were the same whether they were there a long time or a short time. So she's not been pleased with the um, observation status as an issue. And the, she says the two midnight rule isn't helping the situation. Yeah, it would not help the situation as they did a retrospective application of that rule. Now, there have been a couple of people who have started defending observation, uh, and there was an article in Health Affairs where um, observation units were defended as a better way of providing care. And the authors of that article described four types of observation status. And their, their best type was the protocol-driven observation unit, which they said was very good and helpful and was, you know, lower cost, shorter stays, uh, greater patient satisfaction, better outcomes, better use of hospital resources. That was a limited type of observation unit. He said type four about observation, where the bed can be anywhere, is what's generally done in hospitals, but it doesn't really work. So he was promoting observation status for uh, for specific uh, observation units as providing care. Well, Dr. Sheehy had, I just read her comment on this, and she said the problem with it is that the observation units they're talking about exclude certain patients. They exclude patients, even if they had the di one of the five diagnoses that they were talking about. Um, so they excluded patients who came from nursing homes, they excluded patients who had severe dementia, and they excluded patients that had what she called social issues that would make discharge difficult. And the five diagnoses in these type 1 observation units accounted for only 20 percent of the diagnoses that she identified in her hospital. And in fact, she had identified over a thousand different diagnoses of people in observation. So observation units, she is not, uh, she said it's not the real world. It might work, but that's not how medicine is practiced now. And it's not really aligned with, with reality. The other defense of observation is an article by several people, including um, Patrick Conway at CMS. And that was published in JAMA just in March. Uh, the American Medical Association's journal. And they found that, that the decrease in hospitalization uh, is real, and it's not because of observation stays. Um, so this is sort of the opposite of what Brown University found, that observation is replacing inpatient admission. But this article is basically talking about the readmission penalty from the Affordable Care Act as the cause of observation status. 
And that's not what hospitals or anybody else thinks is the cause of observation status. As I said before, the cause is the recovery audit contractor and condition code 41, 44. But primarily the recovery auditors, those are the cause, uh, not readmission penalties. So now I want to talk a little bit about what we tell people to do when they call us, and these really are daily calls to our program. Uh, if the patient is in the hospital, we say try to get the status changed to inpatient. There's no real way to do that. So Medicare does not give people a notice. When there's a denial of Medicare coverage, there's always a notice and people have a right to appeal, get an immediate decision by Medicare. The healthcare provider says you don't need this service, there's a notice, people get an immediate appeal. Um, Medicare does not consider observation status an appealable issue because they don't consider it a denial of hospital care. They're just saying, well, it's payment under Part B instead of A. So there's no official notice. There's no way to get the status changed. Um, we say that the physician is the most important ally, but when the physician's inpatient decision has been reversed under Condition Code 44, that's hard to do. And a lot of the hospital care is provided by hospitalists who work for the hospital they may not be willing to buck the hospital. So the examples we have from families are pretty much ad hoc. One son told me that um, he and his mother and their lawyer went to the CEO of the hospital and sat in his office and told him they wanted this, his father's status changed to inpatient and that happened. Uh, you know, we can't tell people to be go sitting in the CEO's office. That's not really a system. but. <laughs> You know, we say do what you can, try to get it changed. It's very hard to figure out how to make that happen. So if the person is in the skilled nursing facility, when we hear from them, uh, we say ask for a notice of exclusion from Medicare benefits. That will at least get the person into the Medicare appeal system. We say tell the skilled nursing facility that the resident is appealing because it's important that the person receive the Medicare covered level of care in the nursing home, otherwise an appeal has no purpose. And a Medicare covered level of care means either therapy five days a week or skilled nursing seven days a week or a combination. Sometimes a nursing homes saying, well, Medicare isn't paying anymore. Now we're reducing your therapy from five days to three. That won't work to get Medicare coverage of the skilled nursing facility later on appeal person has to have gotten a Medicare covered level of care. So we say tell the nursing home that's what you're doing. Uh, now what we've said until last week is due to appeals. People need to appeal from the Medicare summary notice which, which is the quarterly notice that all Medicare beneficiaries get that lists all the health care charges that were submitted to Medicare in the prior quarter by any health care provider. They list Part A, anything under Part A, and then all under Part B, whatever is done under Part B. And we say look for the hospital stay under Part B, which has each service listed separately, um, and then look for the SNF service, which is also going to be under Part B if the person got therapy that the facility submitted to Medicare under Part B. Uh, that's what we've been saying. There was a decision from the Medicare Appeals Council in April that said can't appeal a part, can't appeal the hospital stay because only one bill can be submitted and the hospital appealed it's a, it was a Part B payment you can't get a change to a Part A payment. Now we had a number of AL administrative law judge decisions that did just that, that said I find you're, you were an inpatient, so we're changing your hospital status from B to A, and now I'm looking at your nursing home bill, and yes, you received a Medicare covered level of care, so we're going to pay, have Medicare pay for that nursing home bill. So that had been successful, but now the Medicare Appeals Council said you can't challenge the hospital. So we think going forward, starting this week, we're going to be telling people only appeal the nursing home part. I'm not sure how that's going to work because it's sort of an automatic denial. If you didn't have a three-day inpatient qualifying hospital stay, Medicare will not pay no matter what. So we're going to try to tell people to challenge the hospital three-day 
uh, classification, even though they're not cha challenging the payment, but just challenge the category. I don't know. As a coverage issue. So we're going to start giving different advice. It's a little bit confusing. So, of course, the Medicare appeals process is very complicated. First, people appeal from the Medicare summary notice. That's called redetermination. Then they go to the reconsideration stage to Maximus. Nobody wins at the redetermination stage. A few people have won at reconsideration. Then there's the administrative law judge, and we've had some success there. Some people win and persuade the judge that Medicare should pay for the nursing home care. Then there's the Medicare Appeals Council, and then there's federal district court. So this takes years. I mean, this can take years for people, and a lot of people that we talk to decide it's not worth it. It's just too much work, or they lose at the first level, or they get confused and only appeal the hospital bill, or they only appeal the nursing home bill. They're just, it's very complicated for people, and uh, some people go through the whole process, and in our Connecticut office, we represent people, and we have had some success, but not always. So if the person is out of the skilled nursing facility, has gone to the hospital, gone to the skilled nursing facility, and now is home, what do we tell them? Well, the first thing to determine is whether the person received the Medicare-covered level, level of care in the nursing facility. If not, if the person didn't get the therapy five days a week or skilled nursing seven days a week, there's no point in appealing. But if there is, we tell them the whole process of the administrative appeal. It is complicated for people. So we have a self-help packet on our website that says what to do, has instructions. I have an email that I send to people after I talk to them at length about this. We're going to have to revise our self-help packet, but it's there for anybody to, to get. And, uh, you know, we, we do what we can to try to make information as clear as possible for people about what to do. So now I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes about uh, efforts to get systemic change because, as you can see, these individual cases are extremely complicated, take a long time, and are very, very confusing to people. And the chance of winning is, you know, I don't know if it's 50-50, probably less than 50-50, very, very limited. So we had an individual case in the 90s. A person was in observation. The doctor said, uh, I'm admitting you to inpatient status. And that used to be what happened. People would be in observation for a day then admitted to inpatient status, um, but the paperwork was not done until 2 in the morning. And so the, paper, you know, the admission decision is when the paperwork is completed. And the judge said, well, that's pretty ridiculous. Uh, the person, the doctor ordered it, um, got the same care. I'm saying Medicare will pay for, for that um, nursing home stay. So that was very nice for the individual. We filed a, a nationwide class action, Landers, in the, in the 2000s. Um, and that case was unsuccessful uh, because the court deferred to the interpretation of CMS. Now, they get up, the government lawyers get up in court and say, Medicare is a very complicated law. It's so confusing and difficult. You have to defer to the administrative agency that has expertise. And our lead attorney, our director of litigation, an outstanding lawyer, got up. I was there in court watching this. He said, it's a, it, this is not a complicated case. We're talking about one word, inpatient. It's not that complicated, you know? He didn't say it that way, obviously. Uh, that's why he's our chief litigator, and, and I'm not. But um, it is not that complicated. But the court, the two judges on the panel, um, decided that they would defer to the interpretation of CMS. And CMS says you're an inpatient when you, there's an inpatient order. And until there's an inpatient order, you're not an inpatient. So we lost. Um, then we filed another nationwide class action. And this was about people who were only in observation for their entire time in the hospital. Um, Landers was about people who were in observation for a day or two. Then they were admitted for two days but they didn't have a three-day inpatient stay because two were outpatient, two were inpatient. They didn't have three. Two and two did not make three. This case, back now, the current case, uh, was people who were in observation status the entire time they were in the hospital. And then they went to the nursing home and had to pay out of pocket. The court dismissed the case in 2013, and we are on appeal to the Court of Appeals. 
The other thing that we really would like to have happen is federal legislation. As the Inspector General said, maybe legislation is the answer to this problem. And there's legislation that was introduced by Joe Courtney from Connecticut in the House. He, I checked this morning, as of this morning, he has 143 co-sponsors. Pretty respectable. When he introduced it in March, he had fewer than 10. So he's really gotten a lot of co-sponsors. Uh, the Senate bill, the companion bill, identical bill, Senator Sherrod Brown has 25 co-sponsors. And it's very simple legislation. A couple of words count all the time. If somebody's in the hospital for three midnights, we don't care if it's inpatient, outpatient, observation. You just count it. The person's there. It should count for purposes of meeting the three midnights day for getting Medicare to pay for its skilled nursing facility coverage. It doesn't solve all the problems with observation, obviously, and certainly doesn't solve the hospital's problem with observation, but it would, it would solve the problem for patients. If they're there, the time counts. Um, the slide says we have a coalition of 26 organizations. Actually, we now have 30. We get constantly getting organizations that want to join because everybody is on the same side everybody thinks this makes no sense and so this is a very broad coalition a lot of people we are not usually on the same side with um, are on the are supporting this so we have the nursing home trade associations the american medical association the society for hospital medicine american medical directors association aarp national committee preserve social security and medicare of course a lot of the advocacy organizations like mine um, Everybody is on the same side, and there is no opposition to this legislation. But <laughs> that doesn't mean it gets passed. As we know, Congress is a little bit dysfunctional. We have been hoping that it would get included in the SGR bill, the Doc Fix bill, but that didn't happen. And now that bill is pushed off to 2015. So it's troubling. Um, if it doesn't get passed this year, then it has to get reintroduced next year, this legislation, and we just start all over again. And also the people would only count who would get covered and protected would be the people from January 2015 going forward. So all the people that would love to have this legislation passed now to be able to get their Medicare claims for nursing home coverage considered would be out of luck. But uh, I think when we have gone, our coalition, not all 30 organizations goes to the Hill, but whoever can go to the meetings goes, we go together, and we walk into offices now and they say, we know what the issue is, the senator's mother was in observation, so there's no question about the value of what we're saying, the questions are, what is the Congressional Budget Office score, what will it cost, and there is no CBO score, CBO still has not done an official score. So that's a problem. So here's the link to our website. We have a lot of updates on observation because I write about this all the time. Anything that happens, you know, we write. We do weekly alerts that anybody can sign up and get for free. Comes out Thursday by email. It's whatever is going on. I've written a lot about observation status. So you can get a lot of updated information um, from our website. So it, Joan asked me at, at if I would just say a few things about what I thought the Academy might do, and you might have many more ideas that are much better than mine, but um, here are just the things that I thought you might want to do. Of course, join our fact sheet, join our coalition. Uh, we'll put your logo up on the top. We're having a little problem with our fact sheet. It has to be one page, and we have a lot of logos. So the font is getting smaller and smaller, and the margins are getting smaller and smaller, but we want all those colored logos on top. So we'd love to have you join us. Uh, we would, I think it would be terrific if the nurses could work with the hospitals to make sure that, that the patients are getting timely, accurate, and meaningful information about what is going on with their status and what will happen. People do need to know, and I think patients get very upset with hospitals when they find out at the time of discharge that uh, and they're told bring their checkbook to the nursing home because Medicare isn't paying. So it's important that hospitals tell tell their patients what's going on. It would be really outstanding, I think, if if nurses in the academy would evaluate what's going on in their own hospitals uh, with observation and write up the findings for either professional journals 
letters to the editor, some way to get information out about what is really happening and what is the impact. This is what Ann Sheehy has done with her hospital, having concrete, inf concrete information about what is going on is very helpful and meaningful. Advocacy at the state level could be helpful as well. Sponsoring a public forum on observation could be useful. Uh, supporting the state legislation to give people information, writing letters to the editor or opinion pieces would be terrific. Uh, and finally, some federal advocacy, uh, writing your senators and representatives with your experience about observation, asking them to support the legislation, join our coalition, um, work with other organizations, and see what you can do to get the word out about observation status. Uh, and how we can fix it so that patients not only get the care they need in hospitals, but also get the post-acute care they need in skilled nursing facilities if that's where they choose to go. This is where I am. This is how you can reach me. And please feel free to call at any time. I'd be happy to do whatever I can to help you. Thank you. Toby, thank you so much. I think that was, um, this is Tara Cortez speaking, and I, that was a, an excellent presentation of such a very, very important issue. I also think that you have um, covered for us some very important points, and I, I think the education of, um, of people, both hospitals and, and uh, our consumers, our patients themselves, is such an important, important issue. My question to you would be on um, with CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. I, I think that what I hear most of the time is unless we can show some kind of a cost neutrality or cost benefit to um, to implementing a policy, it's very hard for to get congressional approval for this. And it seems to me that this this issue is much more pulling at um, what is the right thing to do for patients and the value proposition of this is really the quality of care that we have to have and maybe we, you can we can speak you could speak a little bit to this and in the meantime I'm looking for questions to come up on my board and I'm asking the audience to please uh, send in questions so that we can answer yours. I think that's a very important point about cost neutrality to implement. You're right, that's what we hear. What's frustrating to us about that is that the law hasn't changed. The law has always said uh, three midnight rule, but the interpretation has changed. So why do we really have to change the law um, in order, you know, and why does it cost money? Why, are we just, why aren't we just implementing the law as it's written, which is if you're in the hospital, you're in the hospital. Um, it's, it's very frustrating to us. But you're right, that is what uh, Congress is looking for now is budget neutrality. And if there's any cost, we've hit, heard all kinds of costs. Originally, CMS said the cost would be zero. We thought, okay, that's terrific. If it's zero and everybody's on the same side, this could just get easily passed. Then we started hearing, well, maybe zero to 40 you know, billion or maybe 50 billion. And, but we don't have any firm number from anybody. Yeah, uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, Amy or Joan, do you have anything you'd like to ask? Does anyone have any questions here? I'm with some colleagues and I'm asking them if they have any questions. Toby, I'm wondering um, myself, I know that sometimes going before um, congressional panels and giving testimonies can be pretty influential. Has AARP done any of that in regards to this observation status? We haven't had any hearings uh, on observation status. We were trying to persuade the Senate Special Committee on Aging possibly to have a hearing because that's an even though that committee doesn't have legislative authority, it's where a lot of issues get aired. Uh, but they they haven't been interested in having a hearing, so we just don't we just haven't gotten uh, the interest from Congress. So it becomes even more important then for us to contact our um, senators and House of Reps on this issue. It's very important that they hear from people. Uh, we always encourage people who call us when they get through the immediate crisis with the family to do. Uh, 
get in touch with their members of Congress and tell them what their problem has been and, and what the impact has been on them. I mean, some people are just out of pocket a lot of money, but, you know, some people really can't afford to pay $13,000 a month for a nursing home. They're not getting the care they need. Uh, and so we're worried about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Toby, this is Amy Cotton, and uh, I'm just curious to know, have the national area agencies on aging uh, been active at all on this issue through their aging disability resource centers where clearly many Medicare recipients are probably calling with these sorts of concerns? Uh, that's an excellent question. No, I don't think they've been involved in our coalition, but you know, the next time we have a meeting, we should certainly invite them. We, we just have meetings whenever we think something important might be happening. Um, <clears throat> so that will be, that's a, very, that's a very good idea, but they have not been involved yet. Any other questions? I'm, I, the board is opened here and I'm watching for them. I don't see anything else um, coming in yet. Uh, I'll pose the next one then, uh, Toby, to you. If, um, in, in addressing these with our Congress, our Congress women, our congressmen, what would be for you perhaps maybe two or three of the key points to get across to our congressional leaders or to anyone else who may have influence in this um, ruling? Well, to me, the main point about this is that people are getting the care. They're getting medically necessary care in the hospital. And they're, if they're there for three midnights, regardless of what it's called, the time should be counted. When, you know, when Medicare was enacted, the average length of stay in the acute care hospital for people over 65 was 12 plus days. The most recent number I saw um, was fewer than six. So people are in the hospital for a very short period of time these days. And the requirement for Medicare coverage has been three days in the hospital. That was, only, that was less than a quarter of the time. Now it's more than half the time. So we, we do really need to modernize the Medicare program to recognize that length of stay has changed. But this isn't even challenging the three-day rule. Uh, Senate, Congressman McDermott has a bill to eliminate the three-day rule because it makes, doesn't make a whole lot of sense the way medicine is practiced now. But just to say, if people are in the hospital, it just seems so obvious. If they're getting the care, then, and it's medically necessary, then why doesn't the time count so that they could get the post-acute care that they need in a skilled nursing facility? It just, it just seems sort of what the American Hospital Association says in their complaints is, it's just common sense. So when they talk about we have reduced hospital stays, people are, have, aren't in the hospital, it doesn't make sense. They're in the hospital, they're in a bed, they're just being called outpatients, not inpatients. And that really is pretty ridiculous. Interesting. Very interesting way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? I'm still watching for them, but I don't see any questions coming up in the board. Well, if anybody thinks of any questions later, you know, there, there's my contact information at the end of the PowerPoint. Please feel free to call, write, whatever. Be happy to talk to you about what you know. Later ideas you have when you think it over, or read the articles. I tried to put URLs so people could get the links themselves and uh, read the articles or whatever the information is. All right. And James, just to your one, the one question we did have on access to the slides, we will follow up. I'll follow up with the Academy office, and uh, we'll put these slides. We'll post them on to the Academy website. Toby, I, I, we can't thank you enough. I think um, you you have a wealth of knowledge in this area. We are so appreciative for you your give for your giving us this opportunity to enlighten us and help us to think about how we might position the academy, our own organizations and institutions, as we move forward and try to influence this very very important issue. So thank you, and we all know how to reach you. I appreciate it. We all appreciate yeah. it. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Toe. Thank you very much.